Um, my name is Steve Ostrander. I'm the sales rep for Tamron USA in the Midwest. Thanks for coming out today. We appreciate uh, the camera company partnering with us on, on those. We're going to get to the presentation in just a second. Um, I'm going to have to get off probably uh, before you guys finish up. So I just wanted to go over a couple of quick things about uh, if you do see something you like in Tamron, um, as Marmando goes through the presentation, um, there are instant savings rebates on lenses right now, a variety of different lenses, and they go up to $200. There's also a promotion on some of the lenses where you get a free $160 circular polarizer when you buy a particular lens. So um, just contact the camera company and they can give you full details on that. Some of the information for as far as the rebates would be on the Tamron website also if you're curious about the amounts. The uh, circular polarizer promotion would not show up there, but um, they have details at the store. And um, you know, even some of the rebates include some of the newest lenses like the 3514, which is a very popular lens and we make the best one in the world. That has a $200 instant savings on it right now, which is the first time that anything like that's ever been offered on that lens. And then for the Sony shooters, because um, we're talking about sports today, aren't we Armando? We are. Okay, so for the Sony shooters that might want to have a, a nice fast lens, the 70 to 180, which Armando is showing there right now, um, Sony E-mount lens is a full frame, and that's coming shortly. You can see how small, and it's very lightweight, but it's super sharp. The reviews are starting to come out, and they've been excellent. That's going to start shipping in the middle of May, but the camera company is taking pre-orders on those now. Um, and if it's uh, what we expect, you know, obviously it's different times right now with uh, people being in the house and stuff, but uh, we expect it to be hard to come by in the first few months because uh, uh, there's been a lot of demand for those, those types of products. So, um, but get your order in with Ward at the camera company and they can help you out. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Armando and let him talk to you about sports. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Armando Flores, and I'm a national tech rep for Tamron USA. Uh, we're gonna be talking about sports today. Uh, first of all, a little bit about myself. Uh, I studied photojournalism at college, and uh, I never really practiced it because when I was going to college, I got hired by Nikon uh, as a rep, and I was there for 22 years. And right after Nikon, a little bit of corporate downsizing, I moved on to Sony and I was with Sony for five years and guess what? Corporate downsizing and uh, I moved on to Tamron. So as I like to tell my friends in the industry, I'm working my, my way up the alphabet. Uh, but uh, anyway, I've uh, my favorite type of photography when I started photography was actually sports photography and I actually practiced it for about 17 years. Uh, at the professional level, uh, just about every type of sport you can think of. Uh, whether it was baseball, basketball, football especially, and boxing. Uh, I did boxing in Las Vegas for about 17 years. So I've done a little bit of everything. And, uh, you know, it's once you get it, once you know how to set up your camera, it's easy. You can do, you can shoot any type of sport. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. What camera modes uh, do you need to set uh, on your camera? Uh, well, obviously manual mode is uh, the preferred. Uh, however, uh, manual mode is a little quirky because uh, if your light is constant or if your light is controlled or if you are using a fixed aperture lens, uh, what you need to do is simply set your exposure, you know, set your settings, and then you, you can forget about it for the rest of the event if nothing changes. Uh, however, uh, as we know, uh, that really isn't the case for most type of sports. So when the light does change, that's when you need to make a change to your exposure. And then uh, it becomes a little uh, tricky because now you're going to have to decide, okay, I'm going to have to contend with the three factors. I'm going to have to make a change to uh, one of the two other uh, factors or both in the opposite direction. And of course, with sports photography, we're dealing with the 
uh, shutter, uh, you know, the shutter or the shutter speed uh, to be exact. So the changes that you make will need to be made to either the aperture, uh, they'll need to be made to the, uh, or the ISO or both in the opposite direction. So if you need a faster shutter speed, you're gonna have to open up your lens. Uh, if you can't open up your lens, then you're gonna need a faster ISO. And that's the way it works. Uh, so once again, when you make a change to one of the three factors, you must make a change to one of the other two or both in the opposite direction. So uh, keep that in mind. So what we're gonna talk about uh, today is uh, understanding shutter speed. Uh, what shutter speeds, uh, what are they, what do they do? Uh, and shutter speed starting point. In other words, uh, if I'm photographing a certain type of movement, where should I start? Camera settings, because uh, you're gonna have to set a few things on your camera uh, to help you with your endeavors uh, in capturing fast moving subjects. And solving a problem. What if I run into a situation? What can I do? How can I uh, correct it? Or how can I you know, get around it? And of course, uh, like any form of photography, uh, there is a lot of practice involved. So um, shutter speed, what is it? Well, in the simplest form, shutter speed is simply the amount of time that you allow the light to come through the lens. That is basically it. However, what you are actually controlling is you are controlling movement. You are controlling uh, the subject matter, whether you're freezing it or whether you're showing a little bit of movement. So where do I start? What are the starting points? Well, um, first of all, I was in a situation a couple years ago. I was in San Diego and we were photographing the Red Bull air races. And um, I took this picture at a slower ISO just to uh, have as a, you know, as, as a learning tool. So my subject was moving much too fast for the shutter speed that I had selected on the camera. So what I needed to do is I needed to change my shutter speed uh, so that I was able to freeze that movement. Uh, right here, you're looking at about a 320th of a second, obviously not fast enough for a subject uh, traveling at approximately uh, 400 miles an hour or so. So what you need to do is you need to know how fast your subject is moving so you can set the appropriate shutter speed. And um, as you can see here on, on this uh, table, if your subject is motionless or not moving and you are hand holding the camera, then your shutter speed can be anywhere between a 60th and a 125th of a second. Because at those shutter speeds, uh, most of us should be able to handhold that camera and lens steady enough. Um, and uh, if your subject is moving around a little bit more, let's say they're walking or some form of movement uh, between a 125th and a 250th. If they are jogging, so now they're moving a little bit quicker, they're running in place or, or what have you, now it has to be between 250 and a 500. As you can see, the faster your subject moves, the faster your, sub, uh, your shutter speed needs to be in order for you to be able to freeze that movement. Uh, of course, these are starting points, so the faster the better. Don't always think that, okay, uh, this, uh, you know, I'm photographing the track meet and uh, I have to set it to a 500 or 1,000. No, you can set it to 2,000, so that's okay. Again, the faster the better, uh, the better your chances are. So anyway, um, that is the, you know, drawback with uh, when setting your shutter speed in manual, you're going to have to sit there and think, okay, I need a faster shutter speed, but now what do I need to do to my exposure? Okay, uh, I now I need to open up my lens. Well, I've got a lens that only opens up to f4 and I'm already at four. Now I have to go and contend with the ISO and uh, that's the way you, you approach it. However, uh, believe it or not, 70% of the time I shoot in a semi-automated mode. Uh, in this case, if I'm using a Nikon, a Sony, a Fuji, a Pentax, a Leica, uh, I can shoot it in the S mode, which is shutter priority. Uh, if you're using a Canon camera, that mode is TV or time value. Uh, but what this mode allows you to do is allows you to select the desired shutter speed. And then the camera in turn uh, sets the aperture for you, but you still have control over all of the other camera settings. Um, there is a sports mode in most cameras, and sometimes it's in the scene mode. You can locate it, you can find it. Uh, however, 
this is a very controlled, it is a fully automatic mode. So in other words, the camera is setting everything for you, uh, but it doesn't even ask you what type of sport you're photographing. So it doesn't know if you need a faster shutter speed than it has actually selected. And you have control, you don't have control over any of the other settings. So uh, once again, I don't quite recommend this because it's fully automated. So maybe perhaps, uh, you know, not use this particular mode. Uh, what I like about shutter priority is, is that I can concentrate on the subject or the action. I can wait for the moment and then just be ready to press the bu button when I want. So if I need a fast shutter speed for one particular shot, I go ahead and select it, you know, fire off a sequence. And if I need to change my shutter speed the very next uh, frame, I can do that uh, by just simply turning the wheel. So if I need to show a little bit of movement, uh, I can do so. I was doing a portrait session out in San Francisco a while back, and we had models in wedding gowns. And the images were okay, but they were a little static. So I asked the model to simply twirl her umbrella with her fingertips very slowly. I then slowed down my shutter speed down to about a 30th of a second, knowing that I could handhold the camera and the lens at that shutter speed fired off a few frames and it made the background a little more interesting, I think. So that is uh, the beauty of shutter priority. Um, camera settings that you're going to want to use for any type of moving subject. Uh, one of them is, uh, is uh, continuous autofocus. Okay, so as the subject moves around the frame, the distance uh, from the subject to the camera changes. So the camera needs to continuously autofocus to keep the subject in focus. So continuous autofocus for any type of moving subject is a must. Uh, another uh, setting that you, you want to use is uh, focus tracking, okay? Most cameras have a focus tracking mode. And in this mode, what the camera allows you to do is the camera, uh, you, you focus on the subject, it finds the subject, it locks the focus. And as the, fo uh, the subject is moving around the scene, uh, it will continue to focus on the subject even if your focus point misses it. So once again, for fast moving subjects, where they are maybe perhaps not filling the frame entirely, or there's a very, um, low, uh, excuse me for a second, I gotta plug in my other laptop right now. There you go, sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, uh, focus tracking is a very useful tool uh, to keep your subject in focus when you're not able to. And continuous shooting. So continuous shooting, once again, uh, very helpful in situations where you are photographing subjects that are moving uh, very, very rapidly. The faster the frame rate, the more choices you're going to have of uh, peak action images. So for example, I'm at Venice Beach and I'm photographing a um, you know, street performer. And I've set my camera up. I had an Nikon D750 with a 28 to 300. And uh, I set the appropriate uh, shutter speed to freeze the action. I let the camera set the aperture for me. And I found that the aperture was closer to 5.6. I wanted a little more depth of field. So then what I did is I changed my ISO. This enabled the camera to uh, give me an F7.1. Uh, so I knew I had a little more depth of field. And that's the way you need to think when you're taking pictures. Uh, first of all, freeze your subject. Do I have enough depth of field? And if not, change my ISO. But anyway, uh, I fired off a sequence of shots and this is what six frames per second looks like. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that again real fast. And there you go. So once again, uh, the faster the frame rate, the more choices you're going to have of uh, you know peak action shots. Most entry level cameras give you a frame rate of about uh, two to three frames per second. Those are the entry level cameras. 
the higher, uh, more professional level cameras will give you a frame rate of anywhere between 10 and 20 frames per second. Uh, so as you can see, you would have a lot more choices to select from if you just want to capture a peak action of a particular subject. So uh, keep that in mind and um, you know, uh, look at your camera and see what type of uh, frame rates it's, it's allowing you. So once again, uh, I am gonna talk about ISO a little bit and the reason is that ISO is the last thing I like to change when I'm uh, doing any type of photography because as we all know, the higher the ISO goes, the noisier the image becomes. Just like back in the film days when you changed uh, from a, a roll of film from a 100 to a 400 or a 1600, you noticed that you got more grain. Well with digital cameras it's noise it's rgb dots in the shadow area so red green blue dots in the shadow area and not all cameras are all created equal so even from one manufacturer uh, to another and one model number to another uh, so what i like to do is i usually like to go out and do a test on my camera when when i get a new one and see uh, what my tolerance for noise is going to be with that particular camera body. And what I mean by that is I go out and test it and see what is the highest ISO I'm going to use for that camera because there comes a point where I think it's just way too noisy and I don't want to go above that. And uh, this is very helpful because there's another camera setting that you can utilize uh, in, in any type of sports photography and that is auto ISO. So you can have your camera select the ISO for you so that if you run into that particular situation where you need to elevate your shutter speed from let's say a 1000 to a 2000 and your lens is already opened up to the widest point it can go, let's say you have an F4 lens, maximum aperture, it's already at F4, you don't have to think about changing your ISO. The camera will do it for you. But the important part is that it is important for you to set your parameters. Uh, in other words, uh, you can actually tell the camera uh, to not go above this ISO number. And the other important thing is that you can also tell it not to drop below a certain shutter speed. So there you go, auto ISO, very helpful uh, when you're doing, you know, just about any type of, uh, you know, sports photography or, you know, any type of photography really when the camera is controlling certain aspects of the exposure. Because there are situations uh, when you're taking pictures that your subject is going to transition from a light area to a dark area and then maybe back to a lighter area. Now in this case, uh, once again, you probably won't have the time to sit there and think about what I'm going to change. So if you're in shutter priority, you simply set your shutter speed, camera sets the aperture for you, and then if you're in auto ISO, it'll fluctuate the ISO for you if it tops out at the maximum aperture. And there you go. So uh, once again, very helpful uh, if you, you know, do run into those situations. Well, uh, solving a problem, I you know, you will run into a lot of problems and it's important to know uh, what things you can do so you can, you know, simply uh, think uh, on the fly. I was at an event in Colorado. This is some, uh, you know, some years ago. And um, we usually go and we have big Pelican trunks full of uh, camera lenses and we'll loan out lenses at those events. Uh, what uh, I did at this event is we had, uh, you know, just about every lens you can think of, but all of the telephoto lenses were the lenses that people wanted. The only thing left was a 180 millimeter, 180 millimeter, 3.5 macro lens. A lens that Tamron designed, oh gosh, over 10 years ago. So I'm at this event, I loaned out all the good lenses, and I decide, okay, I'm going to go out and shoot it. Uh, so what I did is I grabbed the only lens left, and I went out. Now, there were uh, some uh, birds that they were going to allow to fly from one point to the next. And as the birds took the first uh, flight, I pointed at the bird and tracked it and fired off a burst of uh, shots. And guess what? Every single one of those picture 
uh, pictures were blurry. The camera just the camera and the lens just weren't focusing fast enough for this type of movement. Uh, so knowing that after doing the test, I then decided, okay, well, I'm going to figure out where I want to capture my image. So I decided I am going to capture my image here in this direction. I then focused manually on a point somewhere within that path or that area. Okay, so then what I did is I set my aperture to f11 to ensure that I would have enough depth of field in case the bird missed it a little bit or was closer to one point uh, than the other. I knew I needed at least a 500th of a second shutter speed, so I set those two uh, settings and then my ISO had to be set to 800. So having my exposure ready, the bird came down and uh, took a, a flight the second time around. I followed the subject, I kept it in the frame as I was moving, knowing that this is where I was going to fire. So I fired off a burst of five, six frames, and four of them uh, were tack sharp. Uh, and that's how you usually can solve a problem when your equipment is a not focusing fast enough or, or your subject is moving way too fast. Pick a predetermined point, focus on it, and just wait for the action to happen. Another tip that you may want uh, to utilize is when you are shooting some type of sports and you have your camera, I'm left eye dominant, so my camera always goes up here. I always have both eyes open because I can see the subject as it's approaching approaching my frame and then I fire off a burst of uh, pictures. So uh, helpful, especially when you're shooting uh, football. Uh, once again, back to the old days, I did shoot a lot of football for the, uh, you know, for the Raiders and the Rams at the Coliseum. This is years back, of course. And I was at a football game one time and I'll, I'm going to date myself in uh, name out some uh, football players here. So I'm on the sidelines, camera, uh, cameras in hand, uh, had a 402.8, and I was concentrating on the wide receiver. So uh, the uh, uh, quarterback throws a pass. I'm focused on Marcus Allen as he is running, you know, to catch the ball. He catches it near the sideline, probably about five, four or five yards where I am. And then he gets clipped at the end right by the sideline where guess what? He gets pushed right into me. I had both eyes open. I saw this happening and coming. I was able to duck while he jumped over me. I know you've all seen football games where photographers just simply get taken out. So that is an advantage of, you know, photographing with both eyes open. Um, I was lucky on that one. Uh, but anyway, we were out once again in San Diego at the Red Bull Air Races. And once again, we had a lot of equipment out and we loaned out all of the telefolder lenses. Uh, everything from a 70 to 300 to a 150 to 600, all the big long lenses were gone. The only lens I had left was a 70 to 200. Uh, I was using that lens on my 750, which is a full frame camera. And uh, well, it just simply wasn't enough focal length because uh, it wasn't filling the frame enough uh, for me or for my taste. So what I did is I did have a teleconverter and I mounted the teleconverter on the lens, which magnifies the focal length by 1.4. This is a TC 1.4. Okay, so there, we, there is a 2.0 converter. Uh, however, one thing you need to remember about teleconverters or tele-extenders, whatever, however the uh, manufacturer calls them, we call them teleconverters, um, is that it is a lens. There is glass in that tube and you mount it in between the camera and the lens that you're gonna use. That gives you the magnification, but you are now increasing the distance of your original lens and your camera, so you are losing light. Light has to now travel further. So on the teleconverter, on the 1.4, you lose one stop of light. So instead of having a 70 to 200 2.8, you now have a, a, a 105 to 280 f4. That is the uh, equivalent of what you get. Uh, so you lose one stop of light. With a 2.0 converter, you're gonna lose two stops of light. And if you are mounting that lens, on a, um, a on a camera, you're at 600 millimeters 
and you put a 2.0 converter on it, you are now at an effective aperture of f13 because that 150 to 600 is an f5 to 6.3. You lose two stops of light, you're at f13, and guess what? Most cameras, I would say all cameras, there are no cameras that can actually focus with that little amount of light coming through the lens. So it now becomes a manual focus situation. And if you're trying to photograph a, an event like this where they're moving really fast, uh, well, good luck. In that case, what you're gonna need to do is pre-focus like I did in the prior uh, situation and hopefully get the shot that way. Uh, the other thing that I like to do is sometimes when I go to events, what I do is I will take a crop sensor camera with me. Uh, I do have a, a Nikon D500. It's a 24 megapixel camera. Okay, so it has the same resolution as my 750, but the sensor is smaller. So you're viewing a cropped in section of a full frame and therefore you get a crop factor. So it's magnifying basically. Your crop factor is 1.5. So now couple that with a teleconverter of 1.4 and now you get a, on a 150 to 600 with a 1.4, you're gonna get about 1280 millimeters. Uh, one stop loss of light, you're gonna be at around F nine roughly. Uh, and a lot of the professional cameras will uh, be able to focus at that, at that, uh, you know, with that little light. And the reason I like to use either a crop sensor camera or a teleconverter is that, let me go back to this image. You can see that I'm only filling about 25% of my frame here. So if I decide to crop and, you know, fill the frame with that image, I'm going to throw away about 75% of the data. So I go from 25% uh, to full frame uh, in, in the uh, screen here, 75% of the data loss. I started with 24 megapixels, guess what? I'm down to six megapixels of resolution for this particular image. Now, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. I mean, it really depends on what you want to do with that image after the fact. The thing is that, we may not know what we're gonna do with the image maybe a year or two years down the line. So what I like to do is I like to future-proof my images and shoot at the highest resolution possible and then crop in camera and not after the fact so I can keep all my data. So if all I need is an image to do a presentation uh, like I'm doing now on a high definition screen, that's a screen that is a uh, uh, 1,920 pixels going this way and 1,080 pixels going this way. You multiply those two numbers, you're gonna get about 2.2 million. So guess what? All we need is about 2 million pixels to show an image on a high def TV. However, as we know, uh, technology does move forward, and a few years back, uh, they introduced 4K TVs. Well, you now need 8 million pixels because it has four times the resolution uh, to show an image on a 4K monitor. And guess what? Technology uh, go, moves on forward, and we now have 8K TVs. Again, four times the resolution of that. Guess what? You're going to need 32 million pixels to show a, an image at full resolution on one of those screens. So you begin to see where if you crop too much, you might run into a problem or a situation down the line. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so sometimes you may want to change your shutter speed and not freeze the subject uh, to show a little bit of movement or motion or you know to make your image maybe perhaps a little more impactful. Uh, the runner here is traveling at 10 miles an hour. And I was able to freeze the, the runner here at a 500th of a second, no problem. However, I wanted to uh, make it look like he was really moving fast, which 10 miles an hour is pretty quick well, for a runner. But uh, anyway, uh, by slowing down my shutter speed, it allows me to show a little bit of movement or motion. So how much movement or motion really depends on, you know, how much motion you want to uh, show on a particular image. So for example, um, the settings that you're gonna have to do 
on your camera, first of all, to uh, do this type of uh, uh, effect, which is called panning. Basically, you're just following the subject and you're shooting a fast moving subject at a slow shutter speed. Uh, continuous autofocus, continuous shooting, and focus tracking. Once again, the same uh, setup you need for any type of moving subject. And the way you do this is that you're going to uh, acquire focus on your subject at a point in advance. So I will determine that, uh, first of all, I want to take my picture here right in front of me, but my subject is coming off to the, from the right. So I will position my body with my uh, legs pointed in that direction, and then I will turn my uh, hips in the direction that they're coming from and I will acquire focus. I will keep my subject in the same spot in the viewfinder as it's moving across the scene. And once it gets to the point where I want to take the picture, I press the button and I fire off of a burst. What I'm doing is I am untwisting my body, which is a more a fluid motion than pointing your body in the direction that they're coming from and then trying to twist it. It's a little more jittery if you end up here because we can't really rotate that much on the hips. Uh, I do that uh, technique whenever I'm shooting pictures and I get pretty good results. So um, I took out this brand new Sony lens last week, uh, last Thursday as a matter of fact, and um, I went out and shot some uh, cyclists and, um, you know, to see how the lens would perform and how good the autofocus was and all that good stuff. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to shoot some panning um, and uh, basically see what I get. So anytime you do any type of uh, panning type style photography or slow motion blur type of photography, the recommended shutter speed is going to be three to four times what the recommended shutter speed is to freeze the subject. So for example, if you are going to freeze your subject at a 500th of a second, you go four shutter speeds below that, you go down to a 250th, a 125th, a 60th, a 30th of a second. This particular image, uh, they were traveling at over 15 miles an hour. This was shot at a 60th of a second. Okay, then I slow my shutter speed down to a 30th of a second. And as you can see, there's a lot more emotion, a lot more blur. It looks like they're moving a lot faster. And um, it's a little more difficult to keep your subjects nice and sharp. Uh, once again, because you have to keep them uh, framed the same way all the way through. Then I slowed it down a little bit more. I went down to a 15th of a second and this is what it looks like at a 15th of a second. So any little movement uh, uh, you can see that is recorded on the on the screen there. So, uh, you know, once again, um, settings, uh, once again, continuous autofocus, uh, continuous shooting and uh, focus tracking and Keep your image stabilization on, turn it on the camera or the lens, depending on what you have. Um, and, uh, you know, practice this. You're going to find that no two images are going to look alike because each one pass is going to be totally different. So practice, uh, and I mean practice a lot because it really takes a little bit of time for you to get used to uh, any type of sports photography. It is important to know the sport, know what you're photographing because you can anticipate things. Or what you can do is uh, you can have a game plan. So in other words, okay, I'm going to go to this event and I'm going to take this equipment and this time of day and I'm going to concentrate on this particular event. In this case, I was doing the relay races. I was doing the track meet and I wanted to shoot the relay races. I got there early and I saw that they were practicing the handoff and I saw that they, they were having a little trouble with the handoff from the third leg to the anchor. So I said, hmm, I wonder how this is going to turn out. Uh, at you know at the time by the time the gun goes off so i positioned myself around the third turn and uh it had the 70 to 300 lens on there and as they came around i set my camera uh, once again you know uh and just simply waited so i followed the subjects 
I selected about a two fiftieth of a second. And the reason I sh chose a slower shutter speed because I wanted to show a little bit of movement. As you can see, the feet a little bit blurry. I didn't want to completely freeze them. So uh, they were, <clears throat> you know, race started. They were trying to do the handoff and, you know, they kept trying. And guess what? They didn't make it. So anyway, got there early. I saw where the light was coming from. I saw and uh, got my position, set my exposure, and there you go. Do we have any questions? Armando, there's some questions in the chat section. Okay, um, I can't see the, let me see the chats. Um, I'm wondering if somebody can read them off read to them me because yeah, because I can't see them. Uh, first question is, what about using manual with auto ISO? It says I use this for bird photography successfully in most situations. Sure, absolutely. Uh, if you want to set a very specific shutter speed and a very specific aperture uh, for controlling uh, the depth of field, auto ISO is going to work fine because that will be your flexible point. Why not? Okay. Next question is pan with a tripod. Yes. Um, yes, you can pan with a tripod um, if your subject is moving in exactly the same um, manner each time. Um, it can be done, sure. I've tried it a few times, but sometimes your subject may fluctuate a little bit, distance back and forth, and that makes it a little awkward. But uh, yeah, I mean, can be done. Uh, shoot a little bit loose. Give yourself a little more room in case that does happen. And then yes, you're gonna have to crop a little bit after the fact, but yeah, that'll work. Okay, and then when you are panning, which stabilization mode do you tend to use when you're panning? Uh, I will use the, if the lens has the ability to select a panning stabilization. Basically, uh, some of our lenses have three modes. They have the number one mode is optical. In other words, you can see what's happening or how much is correcting through the viewfinder. The number two mode is for sports or for panning. So is going to correct for the movement that you are not causing. So if you're going to be moving this way, horizontally, it's going to correct for any type of vertical or diagonal type of movement. So number two for sports and panning. Okay. And then how about setting aperture and shutter speed manually and go to, going with auto ISO? Yes. Yes. Uh, somebody did ask that before. And yes, absolutely. You can do that. Uh, also, just remember uh, to set your you set your parameters on auto ISO so you don't let the camera go to 12,800. My 750 allows me to do that. Let me tell you, I don't like it. It's too much, much too noisy. When I did my, uh, my ISO test, I found that I will never go above 3,200 on that particular camera. So, Okay. Next question is, uh, they're shooting ski races in the snow. Is it mm -hmm. best to use exposure compensation? Uh, you can use exposure compensation. Uh, that is what I normally do when I'm shooting in a semi-automated mode. Uh, I will set my shutter priority, you know, camera to shutter priority, set my shutter speed, and then take an exposure reading. And if I feel that I need to adjust for it, I will go to the plus minus dial or button or wheel and then, you know, set my compensation that way. Uh, the problem may arise is when they go from when the background color changes. In other words, when you go from a very bright background to a dark background, that is where it can be fooled. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, most lighting is poor in indoor ice rinks, like yes. hockey or figure skating. Do you have a general suggestion for settings or thoughts? Uh, well, for ice hockey, you're going to need about a 500 to a thousandth of a second, especially it, as they move up in level, like you start out with the peewee leagues or the, you know, smaller, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
athletes and you move on to high school, then college and then pro, they're going to be moving much faster. So your shutter speeds at that point have to be more closer to a thousandth of a second to freeze them. You're going to need a lens that has a large aperture for most hockey events. Most indoor arena events, a 70 to 200, 28 is what you use. And you're usually going to be somewhere in the 1600 ISO rating if the lighting is decent. If it's lower or poorer than that, you're, then you're going to have to elevate that ISO a little more. Yeah, and I think that pretty much goes into the next question that came up because the next question was, can you comment about taking sports photos with inside sports arenas where the lighting is lower and pushes the limits of your camera? Yeah. This yeah. Has I, a 750 with the 70 to 200 28 and still struggles. Uh, yeah, well, you're, you're going to have to maybe break the 3200 ISO barrier that I set for myself and maybe go a little higher. Uh, but yeah, for more, for most indoor sports, especially high school and some college, the lighting is just terrible and there's just really not much you can do unless they allow you to set up some constant lights. And of course, that's probably not going to happen, not feasible. And you don't want to use an on-camera uh, flash to freeze the action because it's usually, uh, you know, bothersome for the athlete. So, you, you know, Check, uh, do an ISO uh, setting at 3200 C, see, see if it gives you at least a fast enough shutter speed to freeze the action. It's, it's going to be tough. Each, each, each arena is different. It, it, different, each, uh, you know, venue is different. So. And what about shooting outside at night under stadium lights? Same issue. Same thing. It's going to be, a, you know, I, I shot a lot of high school football as well. And yes, a lot of these uh, arenas, you're at 2.8 and you're pushing the limit at 32, sometimes even 6,400. Uh, but, you know, that's all you really can do. Now, I will tell you that uh, my D750 is four years old. So the newer one is going to be a little bit better uh, when it comes to higher ISOs. But that's not a jump I'm ready to make right now. <laughs> Well, and it's funny because uh, the next question kind of leads into that too about uh, cameras and the limitations. Um, this question is, do you need to have an expensive lens and camera to take a good quality image? I have a Nikon D3400 and still struggle to take a crisp image. Okay. Uh, image quality is really, uh, really comes down to the lens and the glass because once that mirror goes up, it what comes through the lens that really matters. You can improve your photography by simply, your, your image quality by simply improving the lens that you put on it. So if you put a, uh, I can put, you know, uh, give anybody a test, give somebody a 3200 or a 3300, give them a 70 to 200 2.8, and then give somebody else an inferior lens on a much, much better camera. And guess what? The the one with the 7200 is probably going to beat the uh, other one in image quality. And a lot of these uh, um, starter cameras have kit lenses on them that aren't their best efforts. Correct. They're just lenses designed to simply allow you to open the box and start taking pictures. Uh, it's a kit, so they're going to compromise on, yes, image quality, autofocus speed, so on and so forth, and build quality. Yep. Um, any suggestion at a baseball game shooting through foul? Foul ball protective netting. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, two things you can do. You can uh, get as close to the netting as possible. Uh, basically, put it right up against it. Put the lens hood right up against the netting, and you'll find that it disappears. Uh, if you go to a much larger aperture, you'll find that that also helps. Uh, the problem may lie when you're trying to autofocus because the camera's autofocus system is going to see the netting and it's going to want to focus on it. So in that case, you may have to uh, manual focus assist. Uh, Tamron lenses, uh, I would say that 99% of them have a uh, manual override so you can do autofocus, but simply by turning the autofocus ring, when you're autofocusing, you're now manual focusing. So you can touch it up and tell it to go beyond that point. Okay. Um, I already know the answer to this question. The question is, what lens do you recommend for indoor sports, 70 to 200 to 8 or the 150 to 600? Uh, yeah, you know the answer to yeah, that. I know the answer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Def 
definitely a 70 to 200 to 8. I find myself that in most indoor sports, whether it be basketball, volleyball, swimming, gymnastics, you're going to need faster apertures. The only way to get that is with a uh, lens that gives you at least a 2.8 maximum aperture. Uh, so, yes, definitely, 70 to 200 to 8. Do you know what the ISO limit is for the D500? Um, you know what? I That camera does a little bit better than 3200. Uh, it's a newer camera than the 750, so they did tweak it a little bit. Uh, how much higher? Not by a lot, but it does uh, appear to be a little bit cleaner, even though they're both the same resolution. What do you recommend the best way to notice unique angles for photos is while at sports venues? Well, that really depends on the venue and the sport. Uh, usually, uh, you may want to attempt a, depending on the sport, a higher angle, a higher vantage point, or maybe a lower one. It, again, it really depends on the sport and the venue and what access they allow you. But, you know, shooting straight, I'm, I'm 5'4", and I see the world at five feet. But by simply changing my perspective a little bit, uh, you know, I can change that. One thing I can do, and I love this technology, is that, uh, you know, cameras with flip out screens. As you can see here, I can, I can flip the screen out and now I can shoot from the waist at a much lower angle or, you know, shoot from a higher uh, angle and I'm still able to look at my screen here. So, you know, try that. Um, uh, and any, I love this question. It leads right into, uh, you couldn't set this one up better. Any recommendations for sports lenses that are affordable and good quality? And I have to say, it says adorable and good quality. <laughs> either way, I think we fit the bill. They're both, they're both, uh, e either way will work. Well, you know, the one thing about third-party manufacturers, uh, such as uh, Tamron, is that uh, we make a very high-quality lens at an affordable price. Uh, and if you're an Icon shooter, a uh, Canon shooter, or a Sony shooter, there are the choices out there. You can buy a 70 to 200 from the competition. And some of those are over, gosh, $2,800. Uh, the Tamron version uh, of the 70 to 200, 2 2.8 is less than half that cost. And if you do look at the independent ratings, you know, people that actually review the lenses, um, you know, nobody pays them to do a review on the lens. You'll find that 90% of the time they pick the Tamron because of the value. Uh, I, I've read a, a lot of those reviews and they say that this particular lens from this manufacturer is not worth the $1,500 more that they're asking for. So, you know, once again, uh, you may want to look at third-party manufacturer lenses. There's quite a few of them out there. All right. This is the last question that I'll be able to forward to you. It also happens to be the last question on the chat. Um, it was sent earlier, but it's a lengthy question, so I left it till last. Uh, from Joe. It says, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that you've shot sports for many years. I was just curious if you could share some recommendations on how to do this professionally. Uh, how are you able to get access to photograph professional sports or any other sports for that matter? How are you able to afford these ridiculously expensive lenses that you need in order to be able to do this? Okay, so excellent question. And uh, I can tell you the way I got started. Uh, I was in a very unique situation. Okay, I, I did study photography. I had an idea of what I was doing. Uh, but most importantly, at that time, I was working for Nikon. I was working in the professional service department. I was the liaison between the professional, uh, professional photographer and Nikon. If they had a question, on how to take a certain picture, uh, I would get a call and I would try to answer that. If they had a question on what lens do I need to shoot this particular type of event, I was able to do that. But the most important part is that I had access to $3.5 million worth of lenses that I could loan out to photographers. 
And that is where that came in because people would call me, can I borrow this for this event? Yes. And every once in a while, one of them would, would say, hey, I'm going to this event. Uh, can you bring the lens with you? And I'll give you a pass. And that's where it started. That's where I started going to all these events. And once I was there shooting, they would ask me, well, how did you do? What did you get? I would show them uh, my results and they would go like, okay, well, if I can't cover this event next time, are you willing to come and shoot, you know, for us? And once again, that's where it came. So I did, I, I was able to shoot for Reuters, for uh, AP, AFP, and a lot of those wire services because of that. So once again, being at the right place at the right time and having connections. I would recommend you start at the, if you're just getting into it, start at the high school level, talk to the coaches, go out and take some pictures at some events, develop your portfolio per se, and then move on to the college level and see if you can get uh, in with somebody there that will allow you or give you a shooting pass and you will share images with them. That enables you to allow your, uh, you know, portfolio to grow and, uh, you know, get the word out. People will know you will then start doing a few more things and then perhaps you can move on to the professional level. But that is really the only way. I've heard so many stories from so many uh, sports photographers, and I, I tell you, most of them, 90% of them, that's how they got started. It's knowing somebody who gave them a chance to get in and start doing this. Armando, this is Ward. Steve had to take off, so he asked me to answer or ask any additional questions. We had one more. Thanks, Ward. Says, I'm, looking at a, I'm looking at a used Tamron 18 to 200, F3.5 to 6.3 for my Sony Alpha 7 II. Okay, any issues? Okay, Sony A7 II, 18 to 200. Okay, uh, that is an all around walk around lens. It, as you can see by the aperture range, it's a 3.5 to 6.3. It's not going to be the fastest lens. It's gonna be a good lens uh, to use. However, that 18 to 200, is a crop sensor lens. That lens is designed for the smaller APS-C size sensor cameras. So when you mount it on your Sony, you're gonna take the full frame, it's gonna crop, and you're gonna be down at 13 million pixels. You're not gonna be at the full 24 million pixels. So, um, I would say if you're already full frame, I wouldn't go back, I would, move forward and maybe perhaps look at a lens that uh, gives you that full resolution. I hope that answers Okay, now, and Jeff wanted to know if I could only afford a used lens, is that okay versus a new lens? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, make sure, you know, when I was starting out, uh, I would buy some of my equipment and believe it or not, I would buy some of it, some of it used. Uh, however, I was able to test it. I was able to play with it and uh, make sure that it was working. Uh, so make sure you do have that ability. Don't just buy it on the, on the fly. And if you can't return it, then you're stuck with something that may not be performing the way it should. So. And we've just, we've just added a, almost all of our used equipment on our website at cameracompany.com. So Excellent. if you're looking for a lens, you can go on our website and check it out. And then we have a, a 15 day money back guarantee. So if you buy it, you don't like it, we'd be happy to just uh, return it, give you your money back. Yeah. And there's also refurbished equipment and refurbished equipment means that it was uh, returned to the manufacturer for some reason. The manufacturer has in turn checked it completely. One of the repair techs has gone through the lens and then they can't sell it as new. They have to sell it at used and they call it refurbished. So that's also a good way to go. Another question if you have time. I don't know how much sure. time you have. I, but I have a... <laughs> Keep them coming. Okay. I have a D7500, and I'm looking for a zoom lens to shoot indoors in low light. Uh, 7500, indoors in low light. Uh, uh, once again, uh, the faster the better. Uh, lenses with a 2.8 uh, maximum aperture are going to be the ones that you may want to look at, depending on the uh, sport that you're shooting or the event that you're shooting. Uh, once again, 70 to 200, 28. 
Uh, there is also a 35 to 150. That starts at 2.8. And once you get to 150, it goes to F4, which is still uh, may be usable depending on how much light you're uh, looking. That 7500 camera uh, does very well at higher ISOs as well because it's one of the newer and the, one of the latest bodies. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, what's What's after a 70 to 180 for Sony? Can we see a 180 to 600? Um, I do know that uh, we are going to introduce, uh, I've been told, two or three more lenses this year. Uh, so there are some lenses coming. However, uh, we are not at liberty to say uh, what they are. Uh, I have an idea but uh, I can't really say even what my idea is. They won't allow us to, but uh, hopefully, you know, something a little bit longer than uh, 70 to 180. All righty. So Ben wants to know how good is Tamron's weather ceiling? And since you have an MPS background, does it compare well to Nikon? You know, uh, after I left Nikon, um, I did have a whole bunch of, lenses. I mean, I had a, uh, I'll rattle some off. I had a 600 at 4, 500 at 4, 400 to 8, 300 to 8, 70, 200, 24, 70. I had a bunch of lenses. And when I went on to start working for Sony, I compared the two and I go, yeah, they're very comparable. comparable. And then I started working for Tamron. They sent me a whole trunk of lenses and then I compared them one by one, 70 to 200 with a 70 to 200, 24, 70, 24, 70, so on and so forth. And I found that there was really no difference uh, in image quality. The performance was the same. So guess what? Uh, I would say that 90% of those lenses paid for my son's college tuition for the first two years. <laughs> in the in the Excellent. use market <laughs> and then tim responded to a previous question and i'm not quite sure exactly what it means but are they bigger than 190 and that was in reference to the what's after the 70 to 180 for sony right yeah no that's uh 180 is the longest uh op, you know option from us at this time but like I said, we are going to introduce more lenses for the Sony system uh, later this year. So, And oh, and by the way, you got a lot of great presentations. Thanks much, Armando. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Excellent presentation. So you did a fine job there. Oh, thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. And there aren't any more questions, so I, All right. we should probably wrap this up. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Armando. There was a lot of great information there. And just in case anybody wants to know, this has been recorded, and I'll have it posted on our website uh, tomorrow morning. All right. Thank All right. you, Ward. Thank you, Armando. Thanks, everyone Thank you. else. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.